tuning of the code. I'm not going to cover some of the advanced features. This is going to come this afternoon. But if you're just in interested in doing a simple code, what, you can, what we'll do in this next lecture um, will basically give you most of the knowledge you need to do that. So if you're just starting, if you're just exploring, you're just learning, and you, know, you want to say, well, what should I take from today? If you take today's lecture home, this next lecture home with you, that should be the best sort of start to this. The stuff that comes afterwards, the advanced stuff, this may be stuff that you know, goes beyond what you want to do right now, and maybe you just treat it as being more for reference now. So, as I say, I'm not going to cover the entire standard. You should have all got a little um, folded piece of paper that's the quick reference to the open ACC programming model. That's not the full standard. The full standard is sort of 30-odd pages. You can go to the web page and find that if you want. But this is a very handy little quick reference. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what is OpenACC, how does it work, um, what does it look like, how do I use it, where can I learn more, and as I say, a little bit of experience along the way. As I said, it was, it was launched at Supercomputing 11 conference. Um, it was drawn up initially by NVIDIA and Cray and PGI and CAPS, very much driven by um, customer need that they wanted something, a high-level programming model that was stable, because OpenMP development was ongoing at that point, and still is. It offered um, portability and debugging and permanence because you had multiple compiler vendors supporting it. It works for Fortran C, C++. If you want the standard, you can go to the OpenAC webpage. It was initial, initial implementations were targeted at NVIDIA GPUs. As I said before, PGI and CAPS at least now have released products that will target other accelerators. So it's not really thinking about GPUs. It's really thinking about using um, a class of accelerators. Version 2 is now being finalized. In the last lecture of today, I'll talk a little bit about the sorts of things that are being talked, that are going to go into version 2. Um, and as I said, there's... Compilers, the Cray compiler has it uh, in version 8.1. Version 8.2 has improvements. That's why we've got you a pre-release of 8.2 for the course today. The PGI compiler from 12.6 onwards has supported it. Um, so 12 was 2012. So you know, now we're at sort of 13.1 is the latest PGI compiler. The CAPS have had full support from version 1.3. All of these are certainly Cray packages, the Cray compiler and the PGI compiler, the CAPS compiler may well be available. Um, people often say, is there a compiler I can put on my laptop? You know, can I do some free development on this? Um, there isn't really. There is a compiler that was developed by um, University of La Laguna in the Canary Islands. It's a, very much a research compiler, so it doesn't claim to have full coverage. It only works for C. If you try and use it for a full application, it probably won't work. It is a research compiler that, you know, for academic purposes. Um, but there is that one available. And you can download that onto your laptop if you wish, I believe. OpenMP, I've talked a little bit about it. So that if you like, OpenAC is, there's some parts of OpenACC which are thinking about GPUs fairly specifically. The OpenMP acceler accelerator subcommittee is kind of looking at a much wider class of devices. It's co-chaired by Cray and Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments do things like DSPs. So they're thinking about uh, different classes of hardware. Um, so there are discussions ongoing with that. These are, I say the current version is a draft standard. Um, this draft standard is very much going towards um, the final version now. But so. I'm not trying to say you should use OpenACC and you should not use OpenMP accelerator directives. Clearly, the established OpenMP standard is something that people would want to transition to as it becomes more widely available because you'd have a wider class of compiler vendors. Any compiler that wants to say we are OpenMP, let's say, 4 compliant, will have to implement this. So, you know, that gives, it an, that gives the directive-based approach an additional boost, the fact that OpenMP 
is going to include these accelerator directives as part of their programming model. Now, you read the standard, it starts off by talking about execution models and memory models. And being, a, as I said, as my background is not as sort of, a, you know, a compiler, developer, or whatever, it's more as a, a user, my eyes tend to glaze over slightly at these things. But you do need to be aware of this. The execution model is how does stuff run on the GPU. In short, it's just like CUDA. So if you've used CUDA, it's like that. If you want more detail, the main program runs on the CPU. It doesn't run on the GPU. The main program gives work to the GPU. It either transfers, which is generally called the device. It executes parallel regions. So these are kernels. This is work to do. And typically, this might be a, a loop nest where you're splitting up the work of that loop nest amongst the threads of the GPU. The host is in charge. That does everything. It allocates memory on the GPU. It transfers data to the GPU. It sends the kernel to the GPU to execute. It queues up that stuff. It waits for it to complete. It brings the data back. It deallocates. It frees the memory on the GPU. The host is in control. It's doing all of this. This is true whether you're using OpenACC or whether you're using CUDA. It's the same hardware, it's the same model. The difference is that a lot of these tasks here, which in CUDA you would do explicitly, a lot of these are taken care of by the compiler, so you don't write these yourself. The memory model, again, it's very like CUDA. It's the same hardware after all. You've got two different memory spaces, one on the host and one on the GPU. They're different locations. They have different address spaces. Now, with modern versions of CUDA, you have, in fact, what they call a unified address space, which just means that pointers with low addresses are in CPU, pointers with high addresses are in GPU, or words to that effect. So if you look at a pointer address, you can tell whether it's a CPU one or a GPU one. But that's only the address. That hasn't unified the memory spaces. So to move data between the host and the device, you have to do it explicitly. Again, the, C, the compiler might do that for you, but it is a, something that has to be done by a runtime, by software. It's not done by the hardware. You don't have these um, data being kept in sync. The GPUs have a weak memory model. What this means is that you've got these different SMs, these different little clusters of cores, and there's no synchronization between them. They're doing things, so it's, you can, just like you can with CUDA, you can write parallel open ACC kernels with race conditions. It's very easy because of the way that the threads get split into thread blocks, and then the thread blocks get scheduled seemingly at random. So you can get race conditions which give inconsistent or wrong results, Compilers can help here to catch some of the errors, but not all of them. And so you have to be conscious of this. Now, with OpenACC, some of this memory movement is handled by the compiler, and that makes things easier. And things like using um, shared memory, using caching to try and improve performance, the compiler will do some of that as well. But you have the ability to tune this by using clauses, using hints to the compiler. So accelerator directives, if you've used OpenMP, you have this idea that I take a serial code and I can parallelize it by putting comments in the code. So that if I run it with a compiler that doesn't know about OpenMP, or I've told the compiler not to recognize OpenMP, all it sees are just comments. So it just ignores them. But if you switch on this extra functionality, it notices that these comments have a particular a particular special format that give the compiler additional information to do something extra. And for OpenMP, that might be to say, split this work amongst multiple CPUs. For OpenACC, these comments are saying, split this work between the threads that are going to execute on the GPU. So the way you do this is um, in C or C++, like all of these comments, they start hash pragma, 
for Fortran, they start with exclamation mark dollar. And they then have what they call a sentinel, which is ACC. For, in, for OpenMP, it's ONP. For, for OpenACC, it's ACC. Sometimes I say OpenACC, and sometimes I say OpenAC. And I'm afraid this is just um, because I, in the, they make fun of me because I say OpenAC, and they say that this is something British or something European. Because in America, they always call it OpenACC. So I have to try and remember to say OpenACC when I'm speaking there. When I'm over here, I sometimes slip, and I will sometimes say ACC and sometimes ACC. I apologize for that. It's the same thing. Um, it's like tomato, tomato, or ZZ top, ZZ top. It's your preference. So a sim in C and C++, you would say um, you have a structured block of code, you know, a loops, four loops. You would say hash pragma ACC, and then whatever this command is that you're giving for the ACC. And it knows how long this is going to last for because you've got curly braces. For Fortran, you have ACC something, and then you usually have an end statement at the end because it's not as quite, you don't have the same um, block structure that you have in C and C++. You can continue the lines when they get too long. You can use capitals for Fortran if you want. In theory, your open ACC code should be identical to the CPU, except it's got some funny comments in it that can be used to execute on the GPU. In practice, it never quite works out that way. The same as with OpenMP. You never quite manage to do it entirely identical code. So if you need to do something slightly differently when you're running on the GPU, and you've got this idea of pre-processing, and just like you have an, un an underscore OpenMP pre-processing macro defined when OpenMP is recognized, you have the same thing when you do OpenACC. So if you need conditional compilation, that facility is there. Oh, my arrows have slipped. Oh, let's not worry. So here's a first example. It's a Fortran example. A C example would look very much the same. This is not the sort of thing that you would... Um, my J loops disappeared. That's fine. Yeah. Sorry. That's better. That's why I didn't move. Right. Here's a simple example. You add two arrays together and put them into a third array. If you really want to do this on the GPU as a single kernel, and that was the only thing you did on the GPU, it would be a very silly thing to do because it's extremely memory bandwidth bound. And by the time you've moved all the data to the GPU, you would, there's just no reason to do it. But it might be part of something bigger. So you want to add two arrays and put them into a third. To put this onto the GPU, you would simply say, this loop nest is a parallel loop. So you use ACC parallel loop. And then the compiler does the rest of the work. It will look at this kernel and it will say arrays A and B. Well, I only use those in a read-only capacity. So at the start of this parallel region, before I execute this kernel, I should allocate some space on the GPU for array A and for array B, and I should copy the data there from the CPU. It will need to go into an array called C well, C is initialized on the GPU, so at the start, I should allocate some space on the GPU, but obviously I shouldn't copy any data. I should then write a kernel, which will do all of this work on the GPU, and at the end, when the kernel's finished, I should, well, I don't need to copy A and B back, so I should just free the GPU memory for A and B. Array C, I should copy the data back to the CPU, and then I should... Um, free the GPU copy of that array C. So the host arrays A, B, and C have existed throughout. But whilst the GPU's been busy, the host copies of the arrays have just sat there, doing nothing. But then at the end, data is moved back or not as appropriate. To actually write the kernel, I've got all of these parallel little tasks to do. It needs to divide all of these loop iterations over the threads of the GPU. If you used OpenMP, what would happen here? It would split up just the outer J loop. If you don't use OpenMP, just ignore what I'm saying for the minute. The difference with OpenACC is it doesn't just split up the outer loop. In principle, it will split up all of the loops 
including the internal ones. So it'll look at all the values of i and j, and it will split these jobs up over all the threads of the GPU. Now it doesn't, as I said before, the hardware of the GPU, threads are not all created equally. They're different. First of all, you've got this idea that a little group of threads has to execute as a vector instruction. So I've got a warp. So you have the idea that in OpenACC, when you talk about the threads that are grouped together to do the same thing at the same time in a warp as a vector instruction, that's called vector. Your thread block, well, I said you might have 256 threads in your thread block, and that's split up into a number of warps. So in OpenACC, there's, a, there's actually a term for the group of warps that you need. So you need eight warps of 32 to give you 256 threads. And so you have this concept of worker, which is a worker is a warp. It's something that's going to execute using a set of vector instructions. And within that, there are threads that make up the vector inside that warp. There are eight warps if you have 256 threads in your thread block in CUDA. And then you have thread blocks which are going to execute on different SMs in a, in a very unpredictable manner. Those are called thread blocks in CUDA. They're called gangs in OpenACC. Now, if you're in doing CUDA and you, you have to split up the number of iterations between your threads in your thread block, you have to make sure that you don't um, overrun at the end because the number of iterations doesn't quite divide the thread block size. The compiler takes care of all of that. It makes a default decision on how many threads per block to use in CUDA language, and it also will decide for you how many thread blocks to use. Again, these are the sorts of things that you'd have to do manually in CUDA, even if you didn't care about the performance. You've still got to make a decision on what they are. There's a default, made, a default decision made. Caching. Should you use shared memory to stage reuse data? Should you do this explicitly? In CUDA, you might do writing this. You wouldn't for this. It's just such a silly example. But for something else, you might. A stencil. You know, a finite difference. The compiler will do some of that. And then what you can do is you can step in and say, well, actually, you should have made a different decision. So you've got what's called clauses, which you add to the directives, extra information, where you need to. But there is a default behavior. So let's look at a f the first program then. And again, it's this you wouldn't do this on GPU, but if you did, this is what you would do. You're going to take an array, A. It's going to be initialized. You're then going to double the values in the array. And that's it. So what would you do? Well, you've got two loop nests. Each of those should execute on the GPU. So you would say each of them, ACC parallel loop. The compiler's not going to step, go in and auto-accelerate. Auto you can't just say auto-accelerate this code and not put any directives in. You have to say, I want this loop to be parallel. So the compiler here will create two kernels. The first one will do the initialization. The second one will double the values. Could I have done it as one parallel region? No, because I want to make sure it's initialized before it starts doubling values. Otherwise, I could have a race condition. In OpenMP, I might use a barrier to do that within my parallel region. There's no global barriers on the GPU. So the way you do it is you have two separate kernels, one to initialize, end the parallel region, so I know that that's finished before I start the next one. The compiler will look at this. It'll look at the first loop nest and say, oh, A, how should array A move? Well, it's just being initialized, so at the start, just make some space. At the end, copy array A back to the CPU. For the second kernel, it'll say, yes, right, well, I need the values of A, so I'll copy them back to the GPU. I'll double the values, and then the result has changed, so it should go back to the CPU. And of course, this code will work on the CPU. It's not a very good code. It's not very good because we've moved this array, A, at the end of the first kernel to the CPU, and then immediately taken it back to the GPU unchanged, which is, and we, and we said data transfers are the real bottleneck when you're doing GPU ports. So the data is, you know, in the same way that liquid sloshes from side to side in a cup, the data is sloshing from the CPU to the GPU and back. Every time you do a kernel, you're moving all of your arrays. Obviously, this is not going to work. Well, it'll work. It'll just be really slow. So the second concept that comes in is the idea of a data region. 
So what we do here is we say, we bracket a number of kernels, and we say, within that region, I want you to own, I will specify how array A is going to move. If I look at these two kernels together, and I put a data region around both of them, array A is going to be initialized on the GPU, it's going to be changed on the GPU, and finally, the, the, the final values should come back to the CPU. So I put in a data region, and I'm going to say, copy out A. Copy out is a particular clause, and it means, at the start, allocate some space, but do no data movement. At the end, copy the data out, meaning from the GPU to the CPU. Now, when I talked about parallel loop, I said that the compiler will just look at the parallel loop region, and it will decide how arrays should move. That decision is overridden if there's a data region. So it, doesn't do it. it won't separately try and move array A inside there. But what it also means is that for the data region, you can't just say data region and expect the compiler to automatically work out how arrays should move at the boundaries of the data region in the same way as it did for the parallel region. You have to be explicit. So you have to know what your arrays are doing. It would be great if it could do it automatically, but for a real application, and this isn't a real application, where you've got a very complicated call tree and data is being aliased and moved and, and renamed between subroutine calls, it's just too hard. So you have to go in and do this explicitly sorting out how this array moves. And this is what I mean about the thinking. You have to understand your application. You have to understand what data is needed in your application and at what parts of the application. Because most of the work that you do isn't writing parallel loop, it's writing data regions. And you know, it makes it much easier that you just write a little line like that rather than CUDA mallocs and CUDA mem copies. But you've still got to do that thinking and there's no way around that, I'm afraid. Whilst you're inside this data region, now this data region here only includes a couple of GPU kernels. A data region can include serial code. So if I wanted, I could have put a line in between those two kernels, which would execute on the CPU, to do something to array A, to add three to each of the values. If I did that, because that line in the middle is only going to execute on the CPU, because I didn't say parallel loop, it will, execute, will modify the CPU memory copy of A, not the GPU copy, the two memory spaces are independent, and you are taking explicit control of array A, you're saying, so you can do things that you might not expect. You might decide that you're going to reuse the CPU copy of the memory A, meanwhile, to do something else. It's allowed. Um, I, would not, I wouldn't advise it, because you're bound to go mad trying to sort this out. But you are in charge of data movements. There's no automatic synchronization between CPU copy of array A and GPU copy of array A whilst this goes on. Both versions exist, but they're independent. If you really wanted to, I don't know, print out a few values of array A, or you wanted to write every third value of A to disk, and you wanted to get those values back to the CPU, there is a way to do it using a directive called update, where you can within a data region, just move a little bit of data rather than the whole array. So you have the concept of parallel loop, you have the concept of data region. And the first example, really, that's all you need to do with that. I mean, are there any questions on that? A real application doesn't look like what I showed. This is what a real application looks like. I'm going to double the values of my array, but I don't do it by having a single main program. You have a main program. You might initialize some data. It calls a different routine. And within that routine, it's going to double the values of the array. But it doesn't double the values of the array simply by writing two times. It actually calls a function to update those values on an iteration by iteration basis. Now, again, you wouldn't do doubling the values of array this way, but this is more like what a real application looks like. It has a call tree. 
So how does this work? Well, what we do now is, if you look at the main program, it looks very similar. We have this idea of a data region, same as before. The data region includes here a kernel, but it also includes some scalar code, code that executes on the CPU, and that's a call to a subroutine. Now, when we get to the subroutine, we want to double the values of the array, but we, the array is already on the GPU. So how do we say, the array is already on the GPU, please use that version. Don't do data copying when you see parallel loop over there, because you're within a data region, logically, even if you're not sitting in the same main program. The data region spans the call to the subroutine. So you say, you add a clause here which says present, and it says this array B is actually already on the GPU. So you should execute this kernel using that array in the GPU memory and do no data copy. At the end, just leave it in the GPU memory because I'll do something else with it later. So I say present B, I call it B because that's what I'm calling the past array within this subroutine. I have a parallel loop because I want to do this operation on the GPU and I make a function call. Now, at the moment, the way this works is that the compiler will inline that function call because it's within the parallel region. That's an implementation thing. Um, up until Kepler, you certainly couldn't do subroutine calls within CUDA kernels, for instance, function calls. This, there are ways to get around this now, but in general, if that is not available, what will happen is the compiler will inline this. But the point is, because the compiler is doing the inlining and you're not, you are preserving the call tree of your program. And that's important. You don't want to, to go to the GPU. You don't want to have to flatten the entire call tree and end up with one massive main program just to be able to use OpenACC. That's not going to work. People don't want to destroy their application. That's the whole idea of directives. So I've, I've talked a little bit about data clauses. These are the clauses that I was putting on the data or the parallel, um, parallel loop directives that I've talked about so far. And the, the copy in means at the start, allocate some space and move the data. At the end, don't copy anything, just free the space. Copy out works the other way. Allocate space at the start, no data transfer. At the end, bring the data back and then free the space. Copy is just copy in plus copy out. So it moves at the start and it moves at the end. If you want to, and you specify the arrays that you want to move, or scalars if you really want. If you want to only send a slice of an array, a contiguous slice, you can do that using um, subsection notation. So for Fortran, you just use the familiar Fortran 90 array syntax. So if you want to send the first n elements, you do a brackets 1 colon n inside your copy clause. For C and C++, <laughs> confusingly, they use something that looks the same but isn't. So if you want to send the first n elements of a C array, it's start colon length. So you don't do 0 colon n minus 1, you do 0 colon n. And it doesn't matter if you're using Fortran or C, you just get used to it. The problem comes when you're trying to flip between the two, and then you, get, you always get confused. So my advice is don't make mistakes. Be careful. Less flippantly, how could you find such a mistake? Well, you, there's a way to use the profiler and runtime commentary to find out how much data is moved at the start and end of a kernel and what that array was called. And so you start going through that, and you start looking in that commentary that comes out that I'll talk about later to diagnose where you made the problem. Um, Non-contiguous array slices are, some they're not universally supported. Where they are supported, they don't give um, good performance. So in my previous example that I showed, the data I actually need on the GPU is i from 2 to n minus 1 and j from 1 to n. That's a non-contiguous slice of memory. i goes fastest in Fortran. So it's, it's miss one, a block of data, miss one, miss one, a block of data, miss one, because I'm not doing i is one and i is n. I'm assuming the array is n by n here. So you could say, well, for efficiency, since the GPU transfers are so slow, would it be better to do 
to send just the data I need? And the answer here is no. Just send the whole n by n array. Because the bandwidth might be slow on the PCI bus, but the latency is very bad. And if the more separate transfers are due, the more you pay that latency cost. If your array that you're using in your um, loop nest is just a temporary array that's only used in the loop nest as an intermediate part of the calculation, you only want space to do that. You don't want any data transfers. And you, call such, you declare such an array using the create clause. There is still a host copy of that, but it's not. There's no link between them. There's no data transfers between them. So in terms of OpenMP, in OpenMP, if an array has to be shared amongst the threads in your parallel region, you say it's shared. In OpenACC, an array that is shared between the threads isn't simply shared. It could be create, copy, copy in, or copy out because we also have the concept of data movement. And then, in OpenMP, loop variables are private by default, if you use OpenMP. In OpenACC, loop variables are also private by default, but so are scalars. So if you have a scalar um, it temporary value inside your loop nest, you know, you say A equals this, something else equals A, and A is just a, an ordinary variable, you don't have to declare it private unless you want to. Um, sometimes the best advice is to declare it all to be careful. Now, that, all of that is fine, but when I was talking about the data regions, I was saying you have a data region, and then you want to make sure that the data is already on the GPU and only use that version. So what can you do? Well, there's two ways. One way is just say present. And I say, you saying, this, this array is on the GPU. You should use that version. If it's not there, the runtime will flag up an error and your code will crash. Now, you might say, well, that's not very good. But actually, that's really good. Because if you know from your, that you're trying to port the whole application, this routine should only be called inside the data region. It's sometimes quite good that it fails if you accidentally called it from somewhere else where it wouldn't perform properly. It's better to get a runtime error than just a subtly wrong answer from the code. If you do want to call a routine, sometimes you want to double the values of an array on the CPU. Sometimes you want to double the values of the array on the GPU. How do you call the same routine and get it to do the two separate things? Well, then you can say something like present or copy. And that says, is it there? Yes, right. I will just behave like it was the present clause, I'll use the value that's there, I'll do no data movement. But if you want to say, is it there? No, right, copy it to the GPU, process it, copy it back. Then you've got these other clauses which are present or copy, present or copy in, present or copy out. I've just called them present or copy star there. And similarly, you could say, this is scratch space, so give me some space on the GPU, that's create. But if I've already got that space there, don't create me another scratch array. Just reuse that one. So present or create can do that for you. Or if you would rather have runtime errors because you know what your call tree is going to be doing in terms of GPU use, you can just use the present clause. In both cases, that data is being processed on the GPU, either because it was there already or because it's going to be moved, processed, moved back. What if I want to do people always say, well, what if I want this to call this and either if it's on the CPU, do it on the CPU. If it's on the GPU, do it on the GPU. What do I do then? The answer is you can do it, um, but it's a more advanced topic. And we can speak about that later if you really do want to do that. In most cases, you think it's going to be something you want to do, but you discover actually it isn't. So we've not done very much in terms of the directives we've seen. We've seen the parallel loop directive, and we've seen the data directive. But basically, at this point, you know everything you need to start accelerating a code. You know how to create, how to turn a loop nest into a kernel, and you know, and you could say, well, that's all you need, but it isn't, because you, the other thing you need is you need to be able to control the data transfers, and that's the data regions. So you now have everything you need to do practical one and practical two. 
And so practical one is a very simple example. Practical one is basically um, this doubling the values of an array example. I've made it slightly more complicated, but it's the same, the same thing. Practical two is a benchmark code. It's not a very complicated benchmark code, but it's a real code um, called the Himeno benchmark. It's a, um, developed by Professor Himeno at Ricken. It's used quite a lot for um, benchmark tests. And we fully port that code to the GPU, and it runs faster on the GPU than it does running it across all the cores of the CPU if we use OpenMP. So in that sense, it's a win. It's not just hello world that, you know, to say it executed on the GPU. We can actually make it run faster on the GPU using just what we've covered. Yes, there's a lot of tuning you can do over and above that. And not all codes are as simple as practical too. But nonetheless, it is, I always find it quite amazing that with very little intervention, you can actually beat the CPU you know, and beat it properly. Not, a, not faster than one core, but faster than all the cores working together. Nonetheless, so you know, if you want to, you could go away and do practical one, practical two now and do nothing more, but it is worth talking a little bit. I mean, I'm going to talk about more advanced topics. Very quickly, you'll find that you start to need a little bit more information than what I've said so far. The first thing is, You've got a loop nest. Your loop nest has got lots of iterations in your I loop, your J loop, your K loop, whatever. These loop nests, the compiler will divide these loop nests, these loop iterations up over the hardware. Sometimes the decision that it makes is not optimal. Usually this is because it gets cautious and it says, oh, I'm not sure, because of the pointers or whatever, I'm not sure that these loop iterations in this inner loop really are independent. So I'm not sure I can vectorize that inner loop. I'm not sure I can split it across the threads within a warp. So the compiler is very good. It does tend to give you the right answers. You know, it's, it's cautious. Generally, you need to step in and say, you've been overcautious here. Actually, you could have done that. So you have clauses that you can use to tune the loop scheduling. Generally, in OpenACC, certainly in the way the Cray compiler implements it, it will tend to split the loop iterations according to the loop. The I loop tends to be split over vector. The J loop, it can do different things with. It's either split over worker or it's done sequentially. The K loop is split over thread blocks. It tends to be very hierarchical in that sense. It's it maps the loop structure you've got onto the threads of the GPU. It doesn't have to do that. It's just, it's just the implementation. Just as with OpenMP, you've got the idea of collapse, where you can, if you've got two loops that don't have a very high trip count, low trip counts are bad for GPUs. GPUs love lots of work. If you give them too little work, you just end up using a, a tiny fraction of the cores, and an individual core in a GPU is not very fast. What's fast about a GPU is there's so many of them. So you've got to use them all. So sometimes this loop-based scheduling, if you've got you know, three loops with a trip count of 100, you've got 100 threads per block maybe, you've got 100 thread blocks, and then you've got 100 iterations that maybe are being done sequentially by the threads within a kernel. That's not very good. If you collapsed it all into one big, long iteration space and partitioned that, you can get better performance. So the collapse clause is used very much like you would for OpenMP. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in a later lecture. And sometimes you can just say, well, actually, I know it looks like a loop nest, but really just this outer loop, just schedule that outer loop over the threads and let each thread, you know, each thread for its K value, it'll do all the I values and all the J values. Just partition this outer loop. And so you can step in and do that sort of decision by using this loop clause, which is where you can say, this particular loop should be treated in this special way. And we'll have a few examples of that later. How many threads per block should you use? That's what you specify in CUDA. That can change the performance. Um, how many thread blocks should you use? 
again, you've got clauses that you can put in where you can control how many threads per block are used. The default is 128, but you can make other choices. They happen to be powers of two that you have to use for the Cray compiler, and they have to be fixed at compile time is one restriction that you don't have in CUDA. And the vector length clause, if you just say vector length 256, that'll give you 256 threads per thread block. And it'll automatically know that 32 threads make up a warp. Or you could say, give me 256 divided by 32 workers. And each worker has 32 threads within it. Those two are equivalent. You don't have to specify the number of thread blocks unless you want to. If you have a kernel that won't take too long to run and you're getting horrible race conditions, every time you run it, you get a different answer. When you compile it just for the CPU, it works fine. There's something, you've got something wrong in the, the scheduling for the GPU. Sometimes you can run it just on one thread of a GPU. It'll be very slow, but you can just see whether the answer is correct and you know it's a race condition and not some bug in the GPU you know, the GPU math library. And so you can actually just say use one thread on one thread block. And then you know that you won't get a race <coughs> condition. What else can you do? Sometimes it looks at the inner loop and says, well, I can't vectorize this. It looks quite complicated. And you just have to step in and say, it's fine. Just do it. So what you can use there is you can just step in and say, this loop, the iterations are independent. Or you can say, well, this actually, this loop, I know you think you want to divide it, but I know that it's only got you know, a trip count of four. It would be stupid to divide this. There's other loops you can divide. Do those instead. Just execute this loop sequentially. So you can use the sequential clause, SEQ. You might decide, well, this kernel, sometimes it's got a lot of iterations. It should be done on GPU. Sometimes it's not got very many at all, and you should do it on the CPU. How do you make that runtime decision? There's an if clause that you can do for that sort of thing. Reduction variables. If you do globally sum an array, you want to make sure that they all add up to give the same, you know, all of them contribute to the same total. Just like in OpenMP, you have to specify that this is a reduction variable. So this is if you're summing up all the values of an array or finding the maximum value of an array. And sometimes you might say, well, actually, I think I know a way that you could speed this up. You could reuse this data. Instead of going to global memory every time, you could reuse it in, the, in a cache. The cache clause lets you do that. That's quite an advanced tuning. We'll talk a little bit about that this afternoon. There are also Cray-specific directives that you can use if you want to block loops and so on. I'm not going to talk about those. They are there. If that's relevant to you, you could look at the man page or ask me. So, you know, already it feels like information overload. As I said, these tuning clauses, you don't need to do these first practicals. I've mentioned them, and I'll give you some more concrete examples of using them this afternoon. But it seemed like the obvious place to talk about them. As I said before, maybe you decide that midway through this big data region that's spanning your entire code, because these arrays just live on the GPU and they're just being processed on the GPU for the whole code, maybe you need a few values back, a checksum, an MPI buffer, you know, something that's going to be exchanged with a neighboring processor. Or for whatever reason, you decide you want to bring back a bit of data, but you don't want to bring back the whole array necessarily. You just want to bring back a bit of data. You have this idea of an update clause where anywhere within this data region, you can say, at this point, please copy, please synchronize this array or this subsection of an array, you know, just a part of the array. Please synchronize it between what's in the GPU memory and what's in the CPU memory, Be you know, for whatever reason, because I'm going to send it on MPI or because I'm going to... Um, print these values out, or because I need to write this, this bit of data to disk. At any point within that ACC, within this data region, within the CPU code, you can just say, at this point, synchronize this part, of this chunk of data, and you either synchronize it, if you do update host, what you mean is bring it back from the GPU to the CPU. If you do update device, you're saying, 
the data that's in the CPU memory, put that to the GPU at this point. Now, it's something I'm not going to really talk about at all. People always ask, well, um, are there ways to kind of tell, th tell the GPU that this data is always going to be on the GPU without using a data region? Are there ways to only allocate space in GPU memory and not allocate space on the CPU at all? And the answer is yes, there are. There are ways to do that. But you wouldn't use these in the first instance. This is a kind of tuning that you would do later on. And um, it's fairly advanced. And to be honest, usually your worry is not um, allocation of CPU memory. Even if you allocate arrays that you never use, the CPU is 32 gig. The GPU has 6 gig of memory. Generally, if you're going to get memory bound, you'll be memory bound on the GPU side. So the fact that... It, when I talk about data regions, it mirrors the data structures on the CPU on the GPU and keeps the CPU ones even if you never use them. You shouldn't really worry about that. There are some other clauses, and I will cover these this afternoon, but I'm not going to... I'm mentioning them there to say that they exist. Now... When I said, here's a loop nest, put it on the GPU. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Assuming that these were n by n arrays, the second one is a huge chunk of memory that's all contiguous. Because in, in Fortran, the left index goes fastest. So I'm taking take, take all this stripe and all the next 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 stripe together. Just miss off the first stripe and miss off the last stripe. Whereas the, the one that's... Have I got these wrong way? I've got these wrong way around, haven't I? Again... Does this answer your question? The one on the right is OK. Because I say, all these blocks of memory, you know, this, this array, which is you think of as stripes, a set of stripes, is actually big, one big long line in memory. And what I'm saying is miss the first chunk, take all the rest, except miss the last chunk. That's what it's saying, because Fortran the left index is going over the full range. For this example, on the other side, there, this is saying, I'm going to take all the stripes, but every time I take a stripe, I miss one, take n minus 2, miss one. And then the next stripe, I miss one, take... So I'm missing bits all the time. So that's non-contiguous. So that's... Um, not okay. Not okay could mean is not supported, or it could mean will perform very badly. So I would avoid that. If you really need, I mean, when would you need to do this? If you were copying the edges of an array to exchange with nearest neighbors, you would probably want, because one edge is fine, it's contiguous, but the other edge is a strided memory access, Pack a buffer on the GPU and copy that buffer to the CPU. It will give you much better performance. We'll talk about that in terms of parallel code later. So far, I've been talking about the parallel directive. If you look in the little booklet that you've got, you'll see that there's another directive called kernels. And when you read the description of the two, it's impossible to tell what the difference is. And why are there two of them? The reason is because they've come from different directions. When OpenACC was formed, it took two inputs. One input was the OpenMP work on accelerator directives. The other was the PGI work on accelerator directives. If you like, the parallel directive is like the OpenMP programming model. It's a prescriptive directive. You say, please accelerate this region. Well, no, you say, do accelerate this region, even if it leads to incorrect results. But you know it will be accelerated. 
The kernels directive is much more like the PGI accelerator programming model. The compiler may accelerate the region, but if it gets confused and it thinks loop iterations are not independent, it may not accelerate that region. So if you really want to know the details, I would go to this article. And it's a very good article, but it's quite, it's quite hardcore as to what the real difference between these two methods is. Which to use, and this really is my opinion, I prefer to use the parallel directive because I know it's being, it fits with the OpenMP kind of picture that I use. Um, I know it's parallelizing, and if the answer is wrong, I'll sort out why. The kernels is perhaps better if you're initially exploring parallelism. Um, all of the examples that you're using are using the parallel directive. They should both work, they should both give you the right answer, so it may become an issue of personal preference. One year ago, the Cray compiler supported parallel and almost no kernel support. The PGI compiler supported kernels and almost no parallel support. Now, they both support both, but... The other thing is, I've talked about parallel loop, but if you look in that little book, it says, well, actually, parallel loop is just sticking parallel and loop together in the same way that OMP do or OMP4, OMP parallel do or OMP parallel 4 are sticking together two OpenMP directives. Why, why, am I, why am I just sticking them together like this? Why don't I just use them separately? The reason I'm doing that is because um, you'll end up with race conditions. I'll say no more than that. I mean, you can do it. There are reasons when you might do it. But if you have a parallel region and you have code within a parallel region, this is likely to become some separate kernels and scalar code and things there is a huge potential for race conditions. And you can easily end up with a problem. So my advice would be don't do this. In OpenMP, threads, creating a thread team is quite expensive. So you, you like the idea, open a parallel region, keep it open for as long as possible, and have separate loop nests within it. And you can use OMP critical or OMP master or OMP barrier to control what's done within there with all the code. GPU kernels, they're cheap as chips. Yes, they cost so many microseconds to launch, but just don't worry about it. If that's the thing that really slowing you down your code, you've done amazingly. Just use separate kernels. If you've got two loop nests and you need some sort of barrier and things between them, or you think you might not need a barrier between them, so could you try and merge them together and not worry about race conditions because you know they're independent, Yes, you can do that, but don't do it. There are other ways to do it that we'll talk about that give greater control. And, well, if, if you must, just don't do it. And there's a technical reason why not, but I'm not going to talk about it now. And the, the why not? You can get into all sorts of problems. What happens if you, for, if you write parallel but forget to write parallel loop? What happens here? It'll work on the GPU, but probably what will happen is every thread on the GPU will do the entire loop nest. So it'll be really slow. So parallel loop is what you need if you want that loop to be divided. Oh, I want to sum up all the values of the array. I know it starts, the sum starts at zero. What should I do? Well, I could say t equals zero, and then I'll say parallel loop. Oh, but it'll copy the value of t to the accelerator, and then do the sum. Couldn't I initialize that? variable on the accelerator. Wouldn't that be better? It would avoid that data copy. Well, first of all, it's an integer or a real or whatever. It's only a few bytes. Don't worry about it. But what if you did this? Could you say a parallel region, initialize on the GPU, and then do the reduction? Would that work? No. Every thread will try to do this job. Different thread blocks are executing at different times. A quick thread will Initialize T and then roar on and it'll start adding values onto T. A later thread block then gets scheduled in and it says, oh, set T to zero. And overwrites what the first thread has been doing, the first thread block. So putting scalar code inside here and thinking it's an optimization isn't because you'll get race conditions. So that's another reason not to split parallel loop like this. What about this? I've got two loop nests. Could I just kind of merge the kernels together like this? Would this be a good idea? No. 
because you'll get a race condition. You might get away with it if the scheduling, if you're lucky with the scheduling, but um, what you'll probably end up with is that a fast kernel gets down here, a fast thread gets down here and starts doing this bit, and it overwrites, sorry, it gets overwritten by a slow kernel that's still up here. You know, it's like using n do no wait if you've used OpenMP. Other problems you can get. When might you want to split it? Well, there are times, but the point here is that these are all ways of adding up the values of this array, and two of them are wrong. And they'll execute, but they'll give the wrong answer. I'm not going to dwell on the details of this here, because I'm, I'm saying don't do the split. But, you know, if, if you want to come back and look at these notes later, you can see why one is right and one is wrong, and so on. Like OpenMP, there's a thing called a runtime API. There's calls you can make in OpenMP if you want to know how many threads there are. You call an OMP routine from the library. OpenACC also has these calls that you can make. Um, I'm not going to talk about them here. And the reason is that there's almost no reason to do it. Unless you're doing something very advanced or... Um, something that's not supported on the Cray systems, like trying to mix loads of different accelerator types all attached to one node, there is no need to use this API. So I will mention it at the end, but it's, for most codes, you just don't need it. You don't need to initialize the accelerator. The Cray runtime does that for you. And all these sorts of things. Where could you learn more? Again, this is for reference. There's the standard and the quick guide. There are discussion lists where you can learn more, you can contact me. There's man pages. There's um, two man pages that deal with OpenACC. This kind of talks about the language, the programming model. This gives you some examples of its use. Some of the examples are very simple. Some of them are very complicated. Um, we haven't talked yet about the profiling tools, but if you want to learn about the profiling tools, there are man pages for that. If you want also things of compiler specific, there's man pages for that. The man pages are pretty good. We try to make them useful. There's some links here to stuff where you can find further information. So you probably do feel it's information overload. So kind of if we go back. What do you need to know? You need to know about the idea of parallel loop, which means this loop nest is going to go on the GPU, please. Split the work up and do it. And the other thing you need is you have to have the concept of a data region. Because you have to be able to say, I don't want these arrays moving every time at the start and end of every kernel. The data region lets you control that. Beyond that, you start to get into the more tuning things. We'll, and I've got a lot more examples this afternoon of that sort of thing. But to just get going, and like I say, without any of that, this scalar Hamino code ran faster than on the CPU. So what's in this lecture should um, give you the grounding to get started. Are there any questions? on silence. Please do, you know, come and grab me, ask whatever questions you like. Um, so, I'm afraid, I apologize, I'm already slightly overrunning. What follows is practical one, which is where this simpler example that I took of, here are the values of an array, I'd like to double them. Practical one basically gives you the code that does that for you to have a look at. So within that directory in the tar file, you'll find lots of different versions of the code. Now, if you're a Fortran programmer or a C programmer, I've been kind. I've given you both. If you like both, look at whichever one you like. So just choose whether you want to look at C or Fortran. Then... There's the usual thing that when you work with C or Fortran, do you allocate your arrays, your data statically at compile time, or do you choose the size of the arrays dynamically at runtime? 
And again, because you with your code, I don't know what you're going to do, I've shown you how to do both. My advice would be look at the static version first. Dynamic arrays with C is a real has some subtlety, shall we say. So I would not you look at that as the first example at all. So if you want to look at C, look at the C static examples. And Fortran, static and dynamic are very similar, but look at the static examples. Then there's three versions of the code there. One is where I do initializing the array and doubling the values of the array as two kernels in the same main program with no data region. The second version of the code puts a data region around them to, sp to improve the performance. Now, this is not a performing code. These are tiny arrays doing silly little calculations. Your G the GPU is not built to do that sort of thing as its main computation. So don't expect these, to, you know, when this isn't a performance measurement. It's looking at how you use OpenACC. Version two, so version two has a data region in the main program. In version three, what happens is, well, I think I've, in, I've labeled them zero, one, and two. In the final version, I'm calling a sub-program that's going to do the doubling using a function. So it's mirroring what I was talking about, where you're starting to build up a call tree. So there's these three different values. So it's going to initialize the array and double the values. It's a multi-dimensional array. Why is, I, why is it a multi-dimensional array? Because I talked before about how OpenMP, OpenACC, OpenAC schedules across the GPU based on the loops. So if I just use a single, a one-dimensional array, you don't see that. So what should you do? Is, by looking at a three-dimensional one, you can start to see what decisions it's taking. So if you want, you could rewrite these yourself. If you want to use them, there's a readme file. If you look in the readme file, it explains how to build and run the code. And I've automated it quite a lot. Um, if you don't like the automation and want to do it all yourself, OK, that's your decision. There's instructions at the end for how to do that. So what you're looking for here is not performance. What you're looking for here is that the code executed on the GPU and gave the right result. It's calculating a checksum of the array at the end just to make sure the result was correct. So as I say, choose F static or C static. Those explain the readme. Try version 0, version 1, version 2. See that they run. See that the answer is correct. Look at the code. See what the differences are. And then also, look at the compiler feedback. There's, when you build it, it will create a .lst file. Open that file up. It's just a text file, so just open it up in Emacs or VI or whatever. And just look at what it's saying in there and how it's putting things onto the GPU. And see, we'll talk about that again. I'm going to go through an example in the lectures. But you can get a bit of a flavor for the sort of information you get from the GPU and how that changes as you put in this data region. So, does, has everybody got these, the practicals, have they? Okay, right. Well, since we're already going so late, you may as well start that and then... Um, hunger will force me to do the next lecture. I'll have to <coughs> be a bit quicker. Is the, pace all, is the pace all right? I mean, the back, I mean, you're the... You're the new, the new users. Finished OpenMP standard is something that people would want to transition to as it becomes more widely available because you'd have a wider class of compiler vendors. Any compiler that wants to say, we are OpenMP, let's say, 4 compliant, will have to implement this. So, you know, that gives, it an, that gives the directive-based approach an additional boost, the fact that OpenMP is going to include these accelerator directives as part of their programming model. Now, you read the standard, it starts off by talking about execution models and memory models. And being, a, as I said, as my background is not as sort of, you know, a compiler developer or whatever, it's more as a, a user, my eyes tend to glaze over slightly at these things. But you do need to be aware of this. The execution model is how does stuff run on the GPU. In short, it's just like CUDA. So if you've used CUDA, it's like that. If you want more detail, the main program runs on the CPU. It doesn't run on the GPU. The main program 
gives work to the GPU. It either transfers, which is generally called the device. It executes parallel regions. So these are kernels. This is work to do. And typically, this might be a, a loop nest where you're splitting up the work of that loop nest amongst the threads of the GPU. The host is in charge. That does everything. It allocates memory on the GPU. It transfers data to the GPU. It sends the kernel to the GPU to execute. It queues up that stuff. It waits for it to complete. It brings the data back. It deallocates, it frees the memory on the GPU. The host is in control. It's doing all of this. This is true whether you're using OpenACC or whether you're using CUDA. It's the same hardware, it's the same model. The difference is that a lot of these tasks here, which in CUDA you would do explicitly, a lot of these are taken care of by the compiler, so you don't write these yourself. Really thinking about GPUs, it's really thinking about using um, a class of accelerators. Version 2 is now being finalized. In the last lecture of today, I'll talk a little bit about the sorts of things that are being talked, that are going to go into version 2. Um, and as I said, there's compilers, the Cray compiler has it uh, in version 8.1. Version 8.2 has improvements. That's why we've got you a pre-release of 8.2 for the course today. The PGI compiler from 12.6 onwards has supported it. Um, so 12 was 2012, so you know, now we're at sort of 13.1 is the latest PGI compiler. The CAPS have had full support from version 1.3. All of these are certainly Cray packages the Cray compiler and the PGI compiler, the CAPS compiler may well be available. Um, people often say, is there a compiler I can put on my laptop? You know, can I do some free development on this? Um, there isn't really. There is a compiler that was developed by um, University of La Laguna in the Canary Islands. It's a, very much a research compiler, so it doesn't claim to have full coverage. It only works for C. If you try and use it for a full application, it probably won't work. It is a research compiler that, you know, for academic purposes. Um, but there is that one available. And you can download that onto your laptop if you wish, I believe. OpenMP, I've talked a little bit about it. So that if you like, OpenAC is, there's some parts of OpenACC which are thinking about GPUs fairly specifically. The OpenMP acceler accelerator subcommittee is kind of looking at a much wider class of devices. It's co-chaired by Cray and Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments do things like DSPs. So they're thinking about uh, different classes of hardware. Um, so there are discussions ongoing with that. These are, I say the current version is a draft standard. Um, this draft standard is very much going towards um, the final version now. But so. I'm not trying to say you should use OpenACC and you should not use OpenMP accelerator directives. Clearly, the established tuning of the code, I'm not going to cover some of the advanced features. This is going to come this afternoon. But if you're just interested in doing a simple code, what, you can, what we'll do in this next lecture um, will basically give you most of the knowledge you need to do that. So if you're just starting, if you're just exploring, you're just learning, and, you know, you want to say, well, what should I take from today? If you take today's lecture home, its next lecture home with you, that should be the best sort of start to this. The stuff that comes afterwards, the advanced stuff, this may be stuff that, you know, goes beyond what you want to do right now, and maybe you just treat it as being more for reference now. So, as I say, I'm not going to cover the entire standard. You should have all got a little um, folded piece of paper that's the quick reference to the open... It ACC programming model. That's not the full standard. The full standard is sort of 30 odd pages. You can go to the web page and find that if you want. But this is a very handy little quick reference. So, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what is open ACC, how does it work, um, what does it look like. How do I use it? Where can I learn more? And as I say, a little bit of experience along the way. As I said, it was, it was launched at Supercomputing 11 conference. Um, 
It was drawn up initially by NVIDIA and Cray and PGI and CAPS, very much driven by um, customer need, that they wanted something, a high-level programming model that was stable, because OpenMP development was ongoing at that point and still is. It offered um, portability and debugging and permanence because you had multiple compiler vendors supporting it. It works for Fortran C, C++. If you want the standard, you can go to the OpenAC webpage. It was initial, initial implementations were targeted at NVIDIA GPUs. As I said before, PGI and CAPS at least now have released products that will target other accelerators. So it's not... The memory model, again, it's very like CUDA. It's the same hardware after all. You've got two different memory spaces, one on the host and one on the GPU. They're different locations. They have different address spaces. Now, with modern versions of CUDA, you have, in fact, what they call a unified address space, which just means that pointers with low addresses are in CPU, pointers with high addresses are in GPU, or words to that effect. So if you look at a pointer address, you can tell whether it's a CPU one or a GPU one. But that's only the address. That hasn't unified the memory spaces. So to move data between the host and the device, you have to do it explicitly. Again, the, C, the compiler might do that for you, but it is a, something that has to be done by a runtime, by software. It's not done by the hardware. You don't have these um, data being kept in sync. The GPUs have a weak memory model. What this means is that you've got these different SMs, these different little clusters of cores, and there's no synchronization between them. They're doing things, so it's, you can, just like you can with CUDA, you can write parallel open ACC kernels with race conditions. It's very easy because of the way that the threads get split into thread blocks, and then the thread blocks get scheduled seemingly at random. So you can get race conditions which give inconsistent or wrong results, Compilers can help here to catch some of the errors, but not all of them. And so you have to be conscious of this. Now, with OpenACC, some of this memory movement is handled by the compiler, and that makes things easier. And things like using um, shared memory, using caching to try and improve performance, the compiler will do some of that as well. But you have the ability to tune this by using clauses, using hints to the compiler. So accelerator directives, if you've used OpenMP, you have this idea that I take a serial code and I can parallelize it by putting comments in the code. So that if I run it with a compiler that doesn't know about OpenMP, or I've told the compiler not to recognize OpenMP, all it sees are just comments, so it just ignores them. But if you switch on this extra functionality, it notices that these comments have a particular a particular special format that give the compiler additional information to do something extra. And for OpenMP, that might be to say, split this work amongst multiple CPUs. For OpenACC, these comments are saying, split this work between the threads that are going to execute on the GPU. So the way you do this is um, in C or C++, like all of these comments, they start hash pragma. For Fortran, they start with exclamation mark dollar. And they then have what they call a sentinel, which is ACC. For, in, for OpenMP, it's OMP. For, for OpenACC, it's ACC. Sometimes I say OpenACC, and sometimes I say OpenAC. And I'm afraid this is just um, because I... In the, they make fun of me because I say OpenAC, and they say that this is something British or something European. Because in America, they always call it OpenACC. So I have to try and remember to say OpenACC when I'm speaking there. When I'm over here, I sometimes slip. And I will sometimes say ACK and sometimes ACC. I apologize for that. It's the same thing. Um, it's like tomato, tomato, or ZZ top, ZZ top. It's your preference. So a sim in C and C++, you would say um, you have a structured block of code, you know, a loops, four loops you would say hash pragma ACC and then whatever this command is that you're giving for the ACC. And it knows how long this is going to last for because you've got curly braces. 
For Fortran, you have ACC something, and then you usually have an end statement at the end, because it's not as quite, you don't have the same um, block structure that you have in C, in C++. You can continue the lines when they get too long. You can use